water has some very unusual properties. First of all, let's learn some basic facts. Water has a density of one gram per milliliter, and a milliliter is exactly the same as a cubic centimeter. They made them the same. We just use milliliters for liquid, cubic centimeters for solid. There's no difference. Not like freaking imperial with cups and ounces. This is, they are identical. Now here's an important fact that will guide you. Water has a density of one gram per milliliter at room temperature. If any object has a higher density than that, it will sink in water. If an object has a density of less than waters, it will float in it. This is the one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing, one thing I want you to remember in buoyancy. Because of this fact, you can turn math into science and fix your problems. How is that so? Because some of you are going to do this. You are going to go ahead and calculate the density of wood. And it's going to bug you because you're going to go, 10 divided by 30. Oh, that can't be right. That will be a fraction. I'll do 30 divided by 10. Kids love doing that. And you'll get a positive number bigger than 1. And I'm going to come over to you and just say, you just calculated that wood sinks. Or you're going to do a calculation and get a calculation showing steel has a density of less than 1. And then I'll say, you just calculated that steel floats. So this is why I could get higher marks in science and math, because you can compare your answer to your real world understanding of how materials behave and correct your answer. Now, the guy who first figured this out was supposedly Archimedes, who got in a bathtub and the water overflowed and he suddenly realized density was the key to it all. And he supposedly ran naked out of his tub yelling, Eureka, he'd figured it out. That's a lie. Archimedes was an early scientist. He was busy trying to burn down enemy fleets with curved mirrors, working out laws of levers, all sorts of other stuff, and he wouldn't bathe. And one day he finally got in the bath and it was his wife that screamed Eureka and went out telling everybody that her bloody husband finally took a bath. And then afterwards, he noticed all the soap scum and gunk off him floating on the surface, and that's how he discovered buoyancy. Now, this is the key here. You've seen your entire life, and you haven't noticed it. You didn't internalize two conflicting facts. All of you, every child knows, cold things contract. And that's why if you go to the lake and you swim out to any depth, your feet get icy cold and the surface is warm. If you're in a building, the cold air drops to the floor. You're told to crawl out of a fire because the hot smoke goes to the ceiling, the cold stuff goes down. The furnace in your house has a cold air intake in the basement and blows the heat out upstairs. And as the cold air sinks, it gets picked up again. Ice is colder than water. Why is it floating? That completely conflicts with your understanding of density. As things get colder, they contract. And yet all of you know ice floats, and very few of you would suddenly go, Wait a minute! The ice is completely given the finger to the law of density. It should sink because it's colder than the water it's in. And trust me, the polar bear is not a Jedi Knight. He's not willing the ice to float. Something happens to water when it freezes and its density drops exactly like it was getting warmer again. And guess what? Water is the only substance that does that. If you make ice out of any other liquid, it will sink in that liquid, not water. Now, without this special property, there would be no life on Earth. And here's why. Water is the only substance known that violates the rule that as substances cool, they contract. Water does this until 4 degrees Celsius. Then it starts to expand again. And this continues until zero and freezing and then shrinkage occurs again if the water is solid. So the density does like the others did. It drops, 
and then suddenly the density begins to slow down growing and then below four degrees the object becomes fluffier again. To be sure, is this effect large? No, it is not. And it would be impossible to detect that in our classroom. We label our graph. This is dense. This is fluffy. Now, as I mentioned prior to this, if an object is denser than the liquid it's in, it will sink. If an object is fluffier than the liquid it's in, it will float. So the top of this graph is a technical term called sinkier. And down below is another technical term called floatier. And I know it's a lot to memorize, but you might want to make a little crib sheet with these. So sinkier and floatier. So if the density of water is lower than another chunk of water, it will sink. Or sorry, float. Now, water's peak density is at 4 degrees. So at 4 degrees, water is as sinkiest as it gets. If water warms beyond 4 degrees, it becomes floatier because the density went down. If water cools below 4 degrees, it becomes floatier again. So the sinkiest water is at the 4 degree mark. And this is true for all other temperatures of liquid water all the way down to minus 40. Wait a moment! Water doesn't go down to minus 40! Yeah, it will under laboratory conditions. Uh, it's kind of a challenge among scientists. It's their version of caber tossing to see who can, like, pick up and throw the heaviest intellectual weight around. And scientists have been able to keep water liquid all the way down to minus 40, and its density keeps on getting bigger again. So uh, all other temperatures will float on top of four degree water. So it doesn't matter where you go on planet Earth, when you go down to depth, the water is uniformly four degrees at all times of year. You gotta get down to about 100 feet, 30 some odd meters, and you'll generally find that true everywhere. Except Toronto Harbor. When I was diving in Toronto Harbor uh, years ago on a wreck called the Scoville, we got down there and my temperature gauge dropped to about minus six. And I barely made it off that wreck without the loss of limbs and everything. But that'd be a story for another day. And why I figured out what's happening there. So this means no matter the weather above, deep bodies of water are at four degrees at depth. And that is why they never freeze. The ice that accumulates on the surface is floatier and won't fall to the bottom. And this means the ice layer in winter actually insulates like styrofoam on the lid of a beer cooler and prevents the lower water from freezing. Okay? And cold and heat simply cannot conduct through all that water. It would take forever. It's a massive insulating blanket. When the seasons change, though, something very interesting happens. Let's imagine right now the water up here is at zero and it's covered in ice. As it starts to warm up in the spring and it hits that magic four degree temperature, then that surface water will start to plunge down and it will cause a rotation of the water body, right? It just simply can't fall down. As it falls, something else has to come up and it starts forming convection cells similar to boiling water. And the same thing happens in the fall. The surface water might be 10 degrees, 20 degrees, and as it reaches that magic four again, it begins to fall. And whichever one falls first will start pushing the water back and this giant circulation begins to happen. It's called a turnover. And this mixes oxygen and nutrients to depth. So one of the predictions of global warming is these over turnovers will start to cease happening. They don't happen in the tropics anyway, but in Canada, this is a major nutrient transport system. 
And if the lakes fail to flip over because the weather stays warm, it may have an impact that we don't fully understand yet on that. So you can see uh, why ice expansion or water expansion below four is essential to our ecosystems. Now, what happens if water didn't do this? If when water got colder, it would just fall to the bottom? Four degrees doesn't seem like much, but once you get the bottom down around zero, um, you're going to start having trouble with some life forms existing in it. So let's just take the extreme case. A block of ice forms up here, and it just plunges to the bottom of the ocean. Now, once it's down there, how is it ever going to thaw again? It won't. It'll never get warm water. So what would happen is all the ice would start piling up in the bottom of the oceans and they would never thaw out. And the oceans would gradually fill every season with a snowfall building up basically an underwater glacier until the depth was such that the sunlight could reach it and seasonally melt that ice. And the Earth's oceans would be like this. This is Greenland. The ice cap is melting, and so water is forming on top. And the ice can't lift, except in a few spots, because it's a solid freaking ice sheet that's locked down to the ground below. But this would be what the Atlantic Ocean would look like. Now, it would be more than this. I imagine you could still f do boats over it, but you would probably find the ocean filled with ice to within like 100 meters of the surface. Now tell me if life would be very different on planet Earth if that happened. We'd have an ice world with just a thin skin of liquid ocean on top. So water has some miraculous properties for us. Now we're going to look at the state change. What happens when freezing occurs? When water freezes, it changes from a liquid to a solid. When water gasifies, right, it turns from a liquid to a gas or it condenses back. There is massive amounts of heat needing to be exchanged at these moments. And there was a really cool lab that I was going to surprise you with that we can't do right now. So when water freezes, because it becomes fluffier again, it expands. And if water gets under our structures and is allowed to expand, you get a thing called frost heave. This is not thermal expansion. This is a state change damage. And why they call it frost heave, you can see. It's lifted the ground. That's not due to thermal expansion. That's due to water freezing. State change property. We are most familiar with water when it freezes. This leads us to believe that the freezing point, which is zero degrees Celsius for water only, is a special temperature for every substance when it isn't. While it's very special for water and for life itself, but a piece of iron froze at 1500 degrees Celsius. From iron's point of view, state change. We are most familiar with water when it freezes. This leads us to believe that the freezing point, which is zero degrees centigrade for water only, is a special temperature for every substance when it isn't. While it is very special for water and for life itself, a piece of iron froze at 1500 degrees centigrade. From iron's point of view, it is already more than a thousand degrees below zero. So nothing magic happens to things that are already solid when the temperature goes from 10 degrees to minus 20. They will continue to contract somewhat, get a bit more brittle, but that's it. This includes gasoline, alcohol, antifreeze. There's no magic happening for these substances at zero degrees. Water, however, changes enormously at zero degrees and releases tremendous amounts of heat. Frost heat versus thermal expansion and contraction. All things, wait for it, all substances. Whenever you find yourself using the word thing, go back and change it later. 
there's another noun that should be in there. All substances change their size when temperature changes, but right at the melting or boiling point, there may be another special size change as it switches from one state to another. A cup of water at the boiling point can turn into a room-filling cloud of gas. Water at the freezing point will grow dramatically in size. This causes freezing water to push against anything in its way. It will break containers and heave the ground. Now we call it a freezing and boiling point. When you reach those temperatures, any temperature change will halt until the state change is completed. So here's an example of an almost 15 centimeter thrust of soil due to the formation of these ice crystals. They tear the soil apart. Here is a leaf that has been hoisted up on frost heave during the day. You can see how much the ice grew and for various chemical reasons it grew in these lovely little straight lines. But the soil was lifted by the formation of the ice. In the Arctic, frost heave can be absolutely ginormous. You see the person here. Um, this makes it um, difficult to make buildings because if the ground moves, it can, it'll, it'll destroy any building that's sitting on it. In the Arctic, there's another thing called pattern ground, and this is due to a repeated frost heave cycle. And it starts to roll the stones over almost like boiling water, and this is due to saturated ground constantly being subjected to freeze and thaw, and it lifts the heavy rocks up and they gradually collect in these cracks. And it looks very much like the, the boiling lenses on water. When you, I call that when you boil water, it cups over and it reminds me of like a lens on a pair of binoculars. Pingos are essentially ice pimples or ice volcanoes that form in the Arctic. This is the expansion of water um, is nearly instant. And these features may actually be explosive when they form. You have solid rock a short distance below this ground. So when the ice forms, so there might be a depression in the ground, like a scoop out in the granite. And the, when the water freezes, it just goes boom and it pushes up and it can happen. These things can detonate like a bomb when they go off. And you find these pingos all over the Arctic like this evidence that there was a frost explosion and in Russia, they've been happening more frequently. So this thing, if you had been there, I mean, you take a look at it. That was a violent explosion that created this. For your house, there's a reason your house has drainage and gravel around it. If the water around your house and the soil is not gotten rid of, when it freezes, it will ram the walls inwards. And one of the signs of it is the sidewalk tipped up. There's only one solution for this. You've got to make sure the ground is properly drained. Here's an example of someone who did not bed their pavement correctly. They did not put enough gravel under the pavement, uh, so the water is collecting, and there's probably not proper east troughing. So water is getting under this deck, and when it froze, it lifted the deck. There's no repairing this. You've got to, unfortunately, take this deck out Dig down a couple of feet up to maybe your, you know, first rib and put in gravel and drainage and you've got to stop water from collecting here. So this is a frost heave feature. Frost heave is due to state change. The thermal expansion and contraction of things that are already solid and not water have nothing to do with state change. A road, sidewalk, pipe doorways do not change state when they cool or heat. So never tell me that an expansion joint is there for when the ground freezes. The ground is already frozen. Now the other end, when water changes state to a gas, it is abrupt and there is a noticeable volume change. Uh, two to three thousand times greater change when it turns to steam. And of course, um, obvious use for the expansion of steam. The most common misunderstanding is those thermal expansion joints, which I will test you on, are not frost protection. The pavement is already solid. The expansion on freezing is unique to water. Zero Celsius is not a special number for things that are already solid, like a loony or a rock. They're frozen already. 
The expansion joint is for seasonal changes in temperature. Frost heave is because water got underneath things and the only solution for that is to make sure the soil is well drained. And that's why we need so much gravel in our construction industry. You bet everything we build on loose gravel, you pack it down, but it's so full of holes, the water cannot collect. And that is the only solution we have. The downside is Dufferin County is full of giant gravel pits where they dug up gravel for building our roads. It's very environmentally damaging what we do to create our buildings, but no one has come up with a better solution than well-drained gravel bedding. The next phase we're going to look at is how this relates to the space shuttle explosion and eternal life.